Thank you very much indeed. That was L'Arpeggiata on today's music show, and we heard the voice of Lucilla Galeazzi, the clarinet of Gianluigi Trovesi. Margit Ubelaka was playing a solterian, and playing the theorbo was Christina Pluha. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, nice to see you again. Hello. Tell us about uh, Carpanese. What was that? Well, La Carpinese is actually a song that comes from uh, the region of Carpino, which is in the south of Italy. And uh, the interesting thing about this song, and also the reason why we perform it with these uh, instruments, uh, which come from the Baroque times, is that um, there is a description of a um, musicologist and a scientist from the 17th century called Athanasius Kircher, who wrote a treatise in 1650, published in Rome, uh, that talks about an um, uh, illness called uh, the tarantismo, which is a kind of illness that you get when you are being bitten by the spider. So the spider is called tarantula. <laughs> and the music, the only way to cure this illness is the music. And the music is called la tarantella. <laughs> but for him... Uh, actually, the tarantella, the, the musical example of a tarantella, he gives is... It's this 
baseline. But that doesn't sound like any tarantella and I've ever heard. And that's the interesting thing, because in the, in the 17th century, for him, a tarantella is in four, a slow bass like that, and it's exactly the tonality that he gives in this treatise. And uh, we still find the same tonality, the same uh, bass line in today's uh, tradition in Carpino, where the Carpinese comes from. So actually what we do is we, we have the traditional song uh, with the traditional text sang by Lucilla Cagliazzi. Then we perform uh, the bass line on our instruments which come from the 17th century. And to this we add <laughs> modern improvisations on the jazz clarinet by Gianluigi Trovesi. <laughs> so you see we... we um, Take uh, a tarantella, which for Athanasius Kircher at the time was a tarantella, uh, which we find in the tradition and we make something new out of it, combined with the old instruments. Which is a, quite a traditional thing to do, in fact, isn't it? To make something new out of, out of a, a ground bass. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, The ground bass is um, actually uh, in the 17th century when they became really uh, in fashion, were all traditional songs that uh, made their way into the written music. Mm -hmm. For example, we have the Giacona or the Folia, uh, bases like that, or the Bergamasca. And uh, some of them were songs that were uh, that had the origin in Italy, but some of them came really from far, far away. For example, the Giacona probably came from Brazil, you know, in the 16th century. And uh, the Folia, actually, there is descriptions in Peru in the beginning of the 16th century. And then they made, of course, with the discovery of the new world, they made their way to Europe and they became really popular within the composers. So we think uh, it, that the folia actually originated in Peru. Exactly, yeah. That's where the first descriptions come from of the folia is uh, Peru, about 1511 or something like that, you know. And only uh, almost 80, 89, 90 years later, you find them then in Europe in the, in the guitar treatises, actually. So... <laughs> it's really interesting. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, but I suppose you, the, there are three strands to what you do, one being uh, Baroque music, one being folk sources, um, and then the, the sort of jazz icing on the cake. Uh, but the, it, leaving the jazz to one side, you can learn a lot about how to perform music of the 17th century by knowing how folk music is sung, traditional music? Um, well, it's a little bit more complex than that because, uh, first of all, there is a kind of world music movement in the 17th century, <laughs> which is very interesting. That's what I've just said about the, all those songs and the dances. They came from other uh, cultures, other countries. They were traditional songs and traditional bass lines. And the composers picked them up and used them a lot, for the written music, as well as the musician used those bass lines for their improvisation in the 17th century, right? Now, what is uh, very interesting uh, about this is that uh, there is a mixture between folk songs and written music at the time existing, yeah? And uh, some of the issues of interpretation and improvisation, of course, that we try to reconstruct uh, being early musicians, uh, are elements that cannot be notated in the in the music from that time, you see. So we try to kind of um, feel our way back to this, uh, this kind of world music movement of the 17th century, you know, by actually inviting uh, a traditional singer uh, to join us, you see, because uh, what she does, for example, on the Carpinesi and, and all the other songs is something that can never be written in music, which is all the rhythmical subtleties, you know, the rubato, uh, the kind of phrasing that she uses, uh, just going a little bit against the, uh, the actual beat and, and things like that, which we have descriptions of in the 17th century that they were doing tempo rubato, you know, and not being... Uh, just uh, on the beat all the time, you know. Monteverdi himself gives descriptions of this kind of rhythmical freedom, but of course you hardly can write it down. I mean, Monteverdi sometimes writes it down. Actually, you know, if you watch carefully, you can uh, you can see the rubato notation in some of his pieces, and in some pieces he doesn't write it down. Famous example is the Lamento della Ninfa from Monteverdi, where he writes uh, that the man should sing on the beat. 
Tempo della and mano. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the, the ninfa can take all the rhythmical freedoms and should go against the beat, you see? So he didn't write in the music, but he gave an indication of well, his uh, f rhythmical freedom. We, we already we can hear the, the connection in what you're saying to jazz. So yeah, exactly. it, it, yeah. it, it sort of makes sense. Mm -hmm. 